So now that I've given you an overview of timed Memoizer EX, let's take a look at how it's actually implemented using the Java Scheduled Executor Service. So as before, it's, it's a class, it's a generic class with generic key value pair parameters. It implements function so that time memoizer EX can be used wherever a function is expected. It's also got a rough counted value nested class, but this particular class is gonna be implemented slightly differently than one, the one we showed before when we talked about timed memoizer. In particular, timed memoizer, as you recall, had separate runnables that were scheduled in the ref counted values schedule method. And this implementation does not work the same way. Although ref counted value is still used to keep track of the number of times a key is referenced within the timeout period. So it has a ref count, that's the same as before. It's used to be incremented atomically every time a key is accessed. It keeps the field, that's the value that's being reference counted. Its constructor looks exactly the same. It goes ahead and initializes the ref count and initializes the value. And it's also got this get method, which will increment the ref count atomically and return the value. So every time get is called, it's going to increment the ref count, thereby indicating to the purge runnable that this particular key value pair was indeed accessed during the last timeout period. The equals method is identical. It has the ability to check whether the reference count is equal to the parameter that's passed in. And the parameter that's passed in, of course, is going to be the n, the m non-accessed ref count that we talked about before. And we'll see how the concurrent hash map remove method will use this to determine whether or not it should remove something because it's stale. Okay, so here's the fields. As we'll see in a second, the, there's a bit more fields in this particular class for, for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about when we get further along into our analysis of the implementation details. As before, we have a concurrent hash map that associates the key with the value. In this case, the value again is a ref counted value. We keep track of the number of uh, milliseconds to wait for the time period to elapse. We keep track of the function to call if we have to compute the value. We keep track of the scheduled executor service. That's pretty much the same as before. We keep track of the non-accessed value whose reference count is always one. That's the same as before. So up to this point, everything's been pretty much the same. Here's where things diverge. We have a couple more methods here. We have a couple more fields rather. One of those fields we call M cache count, which is an instance of a class called threshold crosser. And we'll talk about what the threshold crosser does. It basically keeps track of the number of entries that are in the cache. And we need this particular class and the particular instance of this class in order to ensure that the M purge entries field, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is properly scheduled and properly canceled. Then we also have another field here, which is a scheduled future. And this is what's used to cancel M purge entries when there's no more key value pairs registered in the concurrent hash map. And we'll talk about why we need that as well. And the final field we're going to look at here is the, the one and only runnable, which we call M purge entries. And this is used to periodically purge all the stale map entries. And as we'll see, the apply method, which is the way that you go ahead and call this thing, is going to schedule this runnable whenever the first entry is added to the cache, whenever the first key value pair is added. Now, it might, you might think, well, why don't we just register this one time and be done with it? Well, that's because after things get purged, it may turn out that there are no entries that are registered. There's no key value pairs that are registered. So the next time somebody registers another one, that then again becomes the first time. And so that's what we need our threshold crosser for is to keep track of when we go from zero to one or from one to zero. Here's what purge entries does. You can see that purge entries is actually implemented as a Lambda expression, not an anonymous inner class. And that's because we don't have to access the this, the this reference anywhere. So what it does is it basically just iterates through the concurrent hash map using the for each method. And as you can see, the for each, for each method has a key value pair that is going to be returned to, to the Lambda expression. And what it's going to do then is it's going to run the logic 
to check to see whether a key value pair is stale, and if so, it purges it from the map. And this looks very, very similar to what we had done in the previous timed memoizer implementation with just a couple subtle twists because of the fact we only have one runnable called M purge entries. The first thing we do, which is again identical, is we get the value of the ref count for the value. So we get its value and we stash it away. We then go ahead and try to remove the key. Remember, remove will only succeed if this key value pair has not been accessed during the time period. If that's the case, if it is in fact the case that it was not accessed, then we go ahead and we call a method known as decrement and call at n. And what this is doing, this is a very clever class called the threshold crosser that's going to stop purging the entries when the map becomes entry, it becomes empty. So if we had a value that was greater than zero and calling the decrement and call it n method causes the value to go from one to zero, at that point, we no longer have any more entries in the map. And then we cancel the scheduled future. We say, stop running, shut yourself down, do not pass go, do not collect $200, you're done. And the whole point of this is there's no sense in trying to purge the entries in an empty map. That would just be wasting CPU cycles. However, if we were not able to remove the entry from the map, then we go ahead and call the get an update method to try to set the ref count to the appropriate value, which will either be one if nothing changed between the point when we called get up here and when this call is called. But if something came through and there was an update, then we're going to make the ref count be the current ref count just to give it credit for having been accessed during that time period. Okay. Here's the apply method. The apply method is also just a slight bit different because it only has a single uh, runnable called M purge entries. As before, apply is what you call uh, when you want to associate the value with the key in the cache. And this is going to, this particular apply implementation is going to schedule the one and only runnable under the right circumstances. How does it do that? Well, first of all, it calls the compute if absent method, which checks to see whether or not we've already got a value in the map. If we do, it's going to return that. Otherwise, we do this code here. So this lambda will be used to create, schedule, and return a new value. So what it does is it goes ahead and makes a call to another method in the threshold crosser class called increment and call at n. And we're going to look at that implementation here in just a minute. And what that's saying here is if the current value was zero and it's now going to go to one, and that means the map was empty and now it's going to have its first element in it. And if that's the case, then we're going to atomically schedule M purge entries to run at a fixed delay. So we will atomically schedule M purge entries to run periodically when the first entry is added to the cache. And keep in mind that first entry could always occur multiple times because we might remove them because they became stale. So we're going to go ahead and register this runnable to be called back at M time out in milliseconds time in the future. And we're also going to say, and then periodically call it back at M time out in milliseconds delay. Notice this particular implementation doesn't run at a fixed rate. It runs at a fixed delay because it may turn out that the act of doing the purging could take some time and we don't want to have another call start while we're in the middle of trying to purge something. What we get back from this call is called M scheduled future. And we are going to store that in a field so we can cancel this if necessary, if we have the values of the number of elements in the map drop from one to zero at some point. We then go ahead and make ourselves a new ref counted value by applying the function. And that will then go ahead and do that computation. It'll store with an initial ref count of zero. And then that ref counted object, the ref counted value object, will then have its get method incremented or get, get method called, which will increment the ref count atomically and return the value. So at that point, we've now got ourselves the value set to one, and then that'll be used later by the, the M purge entries, as we just saw, to decide whether something has become stale or not.
Here's the constructor. This is the same as the time to memoizer class, so I won't spend much time on it. We store the parameters. We make ourselves a new scheduled thread pool executor. And then we go ahead and set the policies to be something sensible. The last piece of the puzzle here I want to talk about is the threshold crosser class. And this class is a class I wrote to atomically increment and decrement an internal count uh, by calling a given action when the internal count equals a given parameter. And let's take a look at what it does. The constructor sets the count to whatever its value is initially, which we set as zero. And then we have two useful methods, increment and call it n and decrement and call it n. And what this does is you can see that both these methods are synchronized methods. So this will invoke the action, which is passed in as a runnable, if and only if the internal count equals n after it's incremented. So we increment by one, and if it equals n, we run the action. And you can see also here that decrement and call it n does the same thing. It's a synchronized method, so it decrements the count by one. If by decrementing it equals n, then we run the action. So of course, we're going to use this increment and call it n to detect when we go from an empty map to something that at least has one element. And we're going to use decrement and call it n to decrement the count by one and call the action if it went from one to zero. In other words, the map has now become empty. You might ask, why the heck do we need to do this? Well, the reason we need to do this is because we need to have an atomic check then act way of knowing when the map changes state from empty to non-empty or from non-empty to empty. And we want to be able to atomically do something at that point, like cancel the future or schedule schedule the timer, cancel the timer, schedule the timer. We, we want to be able to do those things atomically under the right conditions. Well, you might say, why don't you just check to see what the size of the atomic, the, the size of the underlying concurrent hash map is, and then do the appropriate thing once you know what its size is. Well, the reason for that, of course, is that checking the size of the map and then canceling is not an atomic operation. Those are two operations. Each of them is atomic, but the composition of them is not atomic. And therefore, we need to make sure that we have a way of being able to atomically check and act. Whereas if we use the size method and the cancel method, that will not be atomic. Each one is atomic, but the combination is not atomic. And we need the combination to be atomic. So this, again, is illustrating some of the subtleties related to doing concurrent programming and doing synchronization and dealing with the fact that the concurrent hash map never locks the entire map on any operation. So we have to do these kind of clever tricks. So that's the end of the discussion of our timed memoizer EX implementation. So now we're, we're going to be in a good position to kind of evaluate its pros and cons.